Hey listeners, welcome to It's the People, our interview series where we explore the inside story of building companies and investment portfolios with high-octane founders, limited partners, and fund managers. We hope these conversations push you to be even better at what you do. This week, my partner Andy Greenfield and I, Wills Hapworth, had the opportunity to interview a fascinating entrepreneur, Ryan Barone, who is the CEO and co-founder of Rent Ready which is a software platform for landlords and tenants that is empowering the next generation of property owners. We discussed a range of topics, including moving from being hunch-driven to customer-driven, hearing Ryan's great advice on how to successfully work with family, the mentality of leaving it all out on the court, always trying your hardest, or as Ryan refers to it, diving for the ball, and much more. To start things off, Ryan begins the conversation with his life story in 60 seconds. Really appreciate you being willing to do this. I'm looking forward to it. Of course. Yeah, me too. You know, we, we like to start these off all in a very similar way. So I'll ask you if you're ready to go. I am ready. If you could just give us a quick life story in 60 seconds, you could take two minutes if you'd like. <laughs> sure thing. Um, so I uh, grew up in upstate New York. I, I moved to New York City uh, for college. I went to Pace University studied economics, math, and computer science. While I was there, I got my uh, first internship at Goldman Sachs, which was pretty close to Pace, and went to get my first apartment, which led me down what's maybe a little longer than a 60-second story, but the path to, uh, in a long story short, the path to eventually rent ready. Um, we're now, for the past uh, six years, been running rent ready uh, with you know, of course, yourselves and then some some great investors behind us and, uh, you know, excited to have the team growing as much as it is, the product growing. It's it's nice to see it come all together. So, so, so Ryan, I'm, I'm curious about, you went to rent an apartment mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, six years later, you're running a multi-million dollar software business. Um, I'm guessing something must have happened, some catalytic event there. Can you share a, a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when I was getting that uh, first apartment, it was close to pace, close to that internship. It uh, made sense for me to just look up something on Zillow or Street Easy and, and go rent it. And it sounded as simple as that. And there were a lot of listing sites out there that had made it really easy to find an apartment. But what I uh, quickly found out was there was a big difference between finding an apartment and renting one. And renting the apartment turned out to be still pretty difficult. So I, I showed up to this unit uh, excited to rent it, thinking I was you know, pretty much done and not realizing I needed letter of employment, bank statement, tax returns, student transcripts, all that for my guarantors and my roommates and quickly realized that there was no way I was getting this apartment because I was uh, vastly underprepared. And so at first I thought it was just me being um, new to renting and that I was bad at it, uh, which certainly was probably one factor of it. But what I quickly realized was talking to a lot of friends was they had similar experiences, even uh, coworkers that were older and had been renting for a lot longer than I had. Um, and in fact, when I started to build an app for myself and friends, initially just for the tenant side to make it easier for us to apply places, I then started to get feedback and uh, insight from landlords to an even larger issue was, which was that it was not just difficult from my perspective, but it was difficult from the landlord's perspective as well. And in fact, the majority of the landlords in the US happened to be the ones I was interacting with, small independent landlords that often had a full-time job and were juggling this themselves at night. And they were saying, hey, wait, you made your side better as a renter. Our side's just as bad, if not worse, make it better for us too. And through that, we were able to iterate far beyond what was just applications initially to really an end-to-end -end suite from the day that the unit goes vacant to the end of the next lease to make it seamless, not just for tenants, but for landlords as well. So then you have everything from listings to pre-qualifying, applying, collecting rent, maintenance, lease signing, and ultimately getting to this very, very uh, seamless experience of renting. Ryan, I'm curious because I think a lot of people might have had that first renting experience and said, oh, this is just the way it is. <laughs> and yet you've now made it 
you know, like a, an early career, maybe long-term career life work to like take this problem on? Was there something, cause, and I'm guessing you've come across like problems in the past, like, mm -hmm. you know, trying to order a slice of pizza at the, you know, and, and yet you didn't take those problems on. What was it about this thing that you said, or maybe didn't I, like, what, why did you choose to dedicate time to this? Yeah. I mean, a huge part of it was the impact, how much it matters in someone's life. There's, I think there are nuances or, or nuisances rather where I say, oh, okay, that was a little annoying. Um, when it comes to renting an apartment, that's such an important part of your life. And so it, it, it's not just even, oh, I went and ordered that slice of pizza from that one place one time and I don't have to go back there again. Renting something I'm going to have to keep doing for many, many years. And so are millions of other people. And there really isn't an alternative to just go to a different pizza place with a um, you know, with better offering. And so um, one, being forced into it where you have to rent, but two, how much it matters. I mean, um, being <laughs> like food, water, and shelter, one of the, you know, the three, you know, critical pieces of life, renting is a portion of, of that shelter one. And so to me, that was, um, a, a, you know, a huge uh, problem to solve. And it, it seemed not uh, to some people, it would probably be daunting to say, okay, this is a really difficult problem to solve. Um, to me, it made it more fun. I mean, it, it wasn't something I was going to solve in a weekend. Um, it wasn't even something I was going to solve in a, a year pouring all of my time and all of my effort into it. Um, and so, I mean, that it makes it all, all the more interesting and all the more fulfilling when you finally get something that people are really excited and come back to you and say how much it matters to them. Right. That's really interesting. But we're going to have to take a step back and drill into your cranium a little bit because there's one, one factor here that we have to understand. Most of us humans run into a problem and we come up with some way of solving it or working around it. And then we go on with our business. Most of us don't go, I have this problem. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to build some software to solve it. And then as I see it extends other places, I'm going to build more software to solve it as opposed to I'm going to rent an apartment and then I'm going to go back to my Goldman Sachs internship or job. Right. Like what is it about uh, Ryan Barone that I got a problem? Okay. I'm going to build something. Mm -hmm. Well, is I that new to you. It wasn't always new to me. Um, I mean, I think part of it probably goes back to my own upbringing. Both, both of my parents had, um, families that had businesses, one in the produce business, um, you know, fruits, vegetables, selling all of that one, um, in more of the promotional side of things. And so uh, I got to see how they worked all day, every day, and they got to create something that wasn't there before. Um, and although that does require a lot more effort to do it, it also comes with a lot of fulfillment when, when it does work. Um, so I think part of it was that, um, I think part of it was, uh, to be honest, and I actually don't know that we've ever talked about this, but you know, it's it, Red Ready wasn't the first uh, invention of sorts I ever tried. I actually had one in high school. If you can believe it, it was polar opposite. Um, it was a uh, mechanical engineering project that was to create um, a way to eliminate invasive species in lakes across the country. So I, I grew up in upstate New York. There was a big Eurasian milfoil issue in Lake George. And so I spent my senior year of high school uh, developing a product that would uh, help prevent that from spreading and uh, costing hundreds of thousands of dollars. At that point, at 16, 17, 18 years old, um, I, d I don't think I had the gall to say, okay, I'm going to turn this into um, something that I'm going to do for a very long time. I do think that uh, kind of, I actually, it is a real thing now. Someone has, and I'm happy they did, took the idea and actually turned it into a business. Um, but I think when something like rent ready came along again, where I said, okay, um, this is a real problem affecting a lot of people. Um, I, I wasn't going to, you know, pass that up a second ago. <laughs> so you use this word, you know, didn't have the gall. Yeah. Like what, what made you think you did have it when the rent ready problem set potential opportunity came about? Like what makes you, what made you then what? makes you now think you can be good at this and take this challenge on? Well, I think I, I certainly had some experiences 
between those periods of times that helped. Um, even at some of those internships, looking at people that had been working in these very reputable uh, companies for extended periods of time um, were very candid to me. And I, I appreciated it. It went a long way. And, and in so many words, got across the point of no one knows exactly what they're doing. Um, they Some people can figure it out and they can make something great from it. And that's even true for these multi-billion dollar conglomerates. And so I think that was to a 16, seven year old, a 17 year old me versus a 20 year old me, a big difference seeing these people that were in my eyes, highly successful and incredibly successful businesses that I think from an outsider's perspective, you would think they know exactly how everything works. There's no question marks in anything they do. Um, and it's because they just, they know everything. And in reality, that, that wasn't the truth. It was a matter of saying, I'm okay with not necessarily knowing everything, but knowing enough to do a good enough job and to figuring out, figuring out a lot of it along the way. Um, I think there was a quote I, I later uh, heard down the line that talked about, you know, entrepreneurship is basically jumping off a ledge and building a plane on the way down. And I think that was the difference between 17 year old me who thought, okay, these people just have planes and saying, okay, I'm just going to jump off the ledge and build a plane on the way down and make sure it's a good plane. So uh, I think that was one of the critical differences, um, even between a few year span there in, in terms of being able and willing to take that first jump. And then especially, I mean, the, the support system around me in terms of friends, family um, that said, you know, this is a great idea. I can see how this would help me, can help other people as well. Um, you should go for it. What do you have to lose? And, and no fear. Oh, I mean, certainly fear. It's it's more so being willing to do it despite fear, not that there is no fear. Now, and you, you, go, Will. So okay. go. Well, you, you just kind of led to a few different things. I definitely want to, you, you mentioned friends and family and the support system. We know you work with your father, who we just know as Ed, and you refer to as Ed. Um, I really want to touch on that. <clears throat> you know, just a question. In, in the greater context of family and working with family, I, I can only imagine sometimes what the dinner conversations at the Barones look like. And again, setting the context that you do work with your father, um, you, you said like there was a support system in place and people, you know, that you trusted and respected who said, go for this. It seems like a good thing to go after. Um, <clears throat> like, do you... It is I don't quite know how to ask this, but like when you go to dinner or like we just finished Thanksgiving, yeah. is rent ready the only thing that gets talked about? Like I have to imagine it's just this consuming thing and, and it's the rest of your family sitting there saying like, oh my God, like more talk about rent ready or is everybody <laughs> saying, let's lean in. I want to, let's chew on the problems and figure out, you know, more solutions. Can you just help us understand like what goes on? Yeah. So, I mean, from the first piece of that, in terms of my dad, I mean, it, there's a huge difference even between someone saying what I, what I said at first, which is, you know, you should go for this and someone saying we should go for this. Um, so, I mean, that was a, a huge difference in terms of him saying, you know, let, I'm, I'm in too, let's do this. Um, and so I think that that speaks volumes, that gives a different level of confidence, even beyond just... Um, someone saying, you know, we support you in this. But then in terms of around the dinner table, I mean, we do definitely think about it, talk about it a ton. Um, and it's it's fun for us. I mean, it's it's constant um, problem solving and and trying to create something better and better and better. And it doesn't end. And that's, that's the fun in it. I mean, you get to create it together. And I think the fact that um, from a family perspective, we are building something, father and son, um, and of course, a, a huge team around us, but um, that we get to, you know, at the end of the day, look at each other and, you know, give each other a hug and, and know that we've, we've, you know, been creating something that's really helpful to a lot of other people is super f fulfilling. But then also, I mean, the rest of my family has been super supportive too. I mean, there have been uh, countless conversations I've had with my sisters and my mom and even extended relatives about you know, different things we should be doing. And my, my uh, great aunt was, I, who I just saw for Thanksgiving was saying, you know, I remember 
you know, six or so years ago when you were talking about this on the the tenant side of things, it was just the tenant app. And I was saying, you know, how are you going to get tenants willing to to put in all this information that they put on an application? Are they going to be, you know, willing to put this into, you know, some app they maybe haven't heard of? And so, I mean, it goes back to, um, you know, even she remembers and I remember, you know, having those conversations years ago all the way up to today. And it's fun to see how far it's come. And, and then fast forwarding from here, you know, a year, two years, five years, um, seeing how far it will go. So, so, so let's just stay on father son for a second, because mm-hmm. as you know, for a lot of investors, that's a, you know, they'll run the other way because mm-hmm. you got family dynamics. And from one perspective, someone could look at Ed, your dad and go, Ed, are you crazy? You should be saying, take that job with Gold- Goldman Sachs. Not only did you not say that, you got into the boat with Ryan. What's the story with your dad? So all my life, he's uh, owned his own business and and the focus for him has mainly been on the sales and marketing side of things. And I think that's where um, as a you know combo son and father team, it has been very different than a lot of different probably partnerships with families where people have a lot of overlapping, if not the same skill sets. We kind of have a perfect match of, of skill sets. Um, I was more so coming from um, the programming side of things, and of course, in the you know in the early days, we've done a ton of the support. We used to answer literally every live chat, the two of us. Um, but it, it worked really nicely that he was coming from more of the sales and marketing side. I was coming from more of this technology side. And in terms of what you need to do well as a business to succeed, was the combination of those two things, and so. Um, we don't necessarily look at it as uh, being partners because we're father and son. We happen to be father and son, but the, the the fact of the matter is that we have great skill sets that work really well together, and that's really the reason that we're partners. And and the fact that we happen to be father and son is just um, kind of a bonus. <laughs> if if you were going to come up with three or four or five words, and this may be awkward, but we're it's our podcast, so we're going to ask it. Three or four or five words to describe Ryan Burrow. Just create a word picture. What words would you use? I would normally let him answer this. I don't want to answer it for myself. <laughs> <laughs> what have you heard? Um, uh, probably, I don't know if relentless is the right word, but <laughs> um, I mean, there's... We talk about this uh, this dive on the ball attitude that we have. Uh, it, it comes from basketball in terms of you know the end of games can can often be determined by someone diving for a basketball or not. And uh, you know sometimes you dive for it and you lose anyway. But a lot of the time, if you're willing to lay out, um, more times than not, you you come up with a win. And so that is certainly something that I think applies to us through and through as a company, but certainly has been core to me from the very beginning um, individually. I mean, I, I never want to do anything part way. Um, I'm, I'm either fully in or fully out. And um, that that's kind of my perspective on that. Uh, certainly, I mean, that that branches off into other things, which again, I've, I've tried to carry over into our business in terms of um, really conveying this perspective of caring. And I think some people talk about it, but to, to really, at the end of the day, have it bother you. Um, and in a good way, I say this, but have it bother you if uh, like a customer or someone that you're trying to help is unhappy. Um, I still look through uh, messages people write online about rent ready even to this day. And um, it it matters to my core. And, and it's true, not just for rent ready, but anything. I mean, I, I want to do things that um, impact people and help people. And and having and conveying that uh, caring matters to me. Um, I don't know. Back, back, just back to Ed. I'm curious. Like you, you work with your father. I'm sure there's any number of horror stories around mm-hmm. family working together. It, any advice that you have for people that are thinking about working with family around key guardrails to put in place or structures to put in place to make sure. You know, things things have, you know, the, the odds of success tipped in their favor rather than just like 
running into the classic issues that you'd expect. Yeah. I think as much as possible that you can try to separate the relationship between, say, if you're starting a business with a sibling or a parent, separate the relationship of you as siblings or as parents or whatever it is from the relationship as you as business partners. Like I would call him Ed when we're working together. I will not call him Ed when we're not working on Rent Ready. Um, and to me, it's it's two totally separate relationships. Um, there's us as father and son. There's us as co-founders in this business. Um, and I think that separation has allowed us to work really well together. And I think the other part of it, which I think is different for different people, but both of us are very um, logical in the way that we solve problems, truly trying to understand, okay, if we're facing this challenge here and we're trying to get to this end point, um, and you think we should go this way and I think we should go this way, we likely have some, go back to your core assumption of what the, the challenge is and then step along the way and and keep solving. And at some point you branch out. You have a, a difference in opinions on something and can you then go back to that point in time and solve that point. And often you will either find that one of your paths is right or one of the other paths is right or a completely third new path emerges because you were able to talk about that point in time where you were diverging and actually there were cons to both of the, the two options you were considering and, you, and you're able to, to eventually reach a better option from that. And so um, I think that not necessarily only applies to um, uh, just relatives, but I mean, any two people that work together, if you're trying to solve some sort of issue and have differing opinions, um, often you have the same ultimate goal and the same initial challenge. So there's something in between that you're diverging from. And if you can break it down into smaller and smaller problems, you can often identify where the disconnect is. I remember when we were diligencing customers before we invested, and we heard over and over again, a theme of Bread Ready has everything you need and nothing you don't. In other words, it was kind of all muscle, no fat. Uh, you know, all beef, no filler. And, you know, as Wills and I and Randy worked with you for the last, you know, I don't know, is it two years now, three years? I'm not sure how long. It's been a, a good long run. We've seen that in your style. There's no BS. There's no fluff. Where th does that just seems to be there as part of the way you guys operate? Where's that come from? I, I mean, I think it's. It goes back to not being satisfied, no matter how good the product ever is or how happy people ever are. I think it goes back to wanting it to be better. And I think that the understanding that it can always be better, um, like Ed always talks about it from the very early stages when I started building it, he talked about the, the, the point of, you know, whatever you think this is today, it's going to be something entirely different, you know, two, three years from now and just keep that in mind. And I, and that has been something I've kept in mind over time. Um, and it goes back to understanding, okay, in the early days, you have to make some some guesses, some assumptions about what people want. And it's going off of my personal experience. Like the initial version one of Rent Ready certainly was. But beyond that, as we start to get more and more customers, they tell us what's wrong. Um, if, if we're willing to listen to them and we're willing to have that conversation, that dialogue, they'll tell us what they want, what they don't want, exact. And if you really dig in with them and say, okay, you say you want this overarching thing, but specifically, how does that work? Would you want it to be like this, this, this? And you can break down um, all of the different ways you could accomplish that thing, whatever the thing is they're describing in many different ways and ultimately get to a better solution. Like, for example, we had a landlord in Texas at one point that needed to um, block payments. And they came to us and said, hey, I can't block payments. My tenant pays even a dollar, resets the clock. Um, can you make a way for me to be able to do that? And we could have just blocked payments on this tenant, but we went back to them and said, okay, well, do you need to block partial payments, all payments? Is it tenant by tenant? Is it unit by unit, property by property? And by working with them, we were able to ter determine that they needed to block this on a tenant by tenant basis. It needed to be both partial and full payments. And that gave them the flexibility to, if they needed one particular tenant to come in and hand them a certified bank check, but at the same time, we're okay with someone else paying with ACH or a credit card, then that was fine. And so that came from having those conversations with them and really understanding the core issue and solution behind it. And I think that goes to any business. 
Um, if you can really talk to your customers, most of the time they will tell you exactly what they want um, if you're willing to listen to it. And uh, if you can dig in with them, they'll they'll really outline exactly how it should work. And the nice thing is as you grow bigger and bigger, you don't have to rely on you know one personal founder's initial feeling or one uh, individual landlord's feeling, but you can start to base that off of tens and then hundreds and then thousands and tens of thousands of users to start making your decisions. So you make better and better decisions as you go along. And, and, and just on that point, because I could imagine conversations like that can take you down rabbit holes of ideas and features that could lead to very custom solutions. And you've been the person who's architected this product. How do you decide like when you know enough, whether or not the thing that the customer is asking for is, is actually the thing that needs to be built, or maybe there's kind of like a root problem. And, and I think at the end of the day, how do you decide like when to make a decision or how to make a decision on some of these things that you're hearing and when not to? Yeah. So for us, I mean, we record all of those, uh, pieces of feedback that we get, even if we're not going to necessarily do them now. Um, it's worth listening to it, starting to outline it. You don't have to get, you know, overly complex with it, but understand the overarching, you know, solution that you're going to implement. And then if we ultimately decide, okay, this isn't worth doing, or it's not worth, worth doing right now, we still have it there. And we actually still even allow the way we're set up is we allow our chat score to still tag people to those issues. So, so say, you know, Andy comes in with this idea this month and we have kind of a workaround that works for him. Nobody's ever asked for it before. And we maybe pitch it to some other landlords to see, hey, is this something that you also would want? And everyone else isn't really too hot on it. We can still have that there. We have the outline of what we would implement and how it would work according to him, but we don't really have enough demand for it at this point. And over time, if we start to hear, okay, Wills wants this, Randy wants this too. And, and in fact, uh, you know, Wills added a little bit of context here where we weren't going to add this piece or we would maybe tweak this. We can bring that back to Andy and say, okay, now would you also like it this way? This is kind of a new approach that we had on it. And we can eventually get to a point where we show it to enough people that all kind of come around to a consensus of, okay, I probably wouldn't have designed it that way on my own. But now that we've pulled together all of this feedback from different people, this would actually work really well for me. And once we have that, it's something that we look at it from the perspective of how can we release a feature that becomes available to everybody. We don't normally limit any feature um, and we roll it out to everyone and they can then use it. And um, the beauty of software is it's not final even at that point. If we continue to get feedback on that, we can continue to iterate and improve that feature as we go along. Um, but it's a, it's a matter of kind of taking in and iterating on that that feedback we get from customers. Can we stay on this for a second? Because as you know, as a software guy, scope creep has mm -hmm. killed a lot of companies. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, and, and there's this delicate tightrope you have to walk be between succumbing to what every customer wants. And so you have, you have you know, 5 million pieces of custom, individually customized software. How do you, what's the kind of the tipping point for you? Because you have Red Ready is composed of a number of offerings to landlords and tenants. Mm -hmm. So some, I'm guessing, never made it into that stack. So right. What's the tipping point? How do you decide and avoid scope creep, but address unmet needs that are important? Yeah, I, I mean, at least one of, and there, there are probably quite a few, but at least one of them on the scope creep side of things uh, that I lean towards is leaning towards smaller projects, not bigger. Uh, and I think the tendency is to let a project just grow and grow and say, oh, well, this is also a good idea. Let's bundle it in and do it together. Um, and I've been victim to the same mistake before uh, where we let too much just bundle into one project and eventually that slows down the ultimate thing and instead take it from the perspective of saying, okay, we have some problem and maybe these five things we're looking at would solve 100% of people's problems in this. But three of those five only really address 5% you know, of the issue. The other nine, 95% is coming from the other two. I would rather say, let's do those first one or two, release those, get feedback on those, possibly improve those, and then come back for the other three. And so 
Whereas you, when you're releasing maybe a hardware product, you don't have that luxury. You maybe have to really take all of that time. With a software product, you can release even just the FERPs. You say, hey, this solves 40% of our issue. We can get it done this week or next week, as opposed to something that might take two months. Um, a lot of people will be happy to have something than nothing. And so um, from that perspective, breaking down that project into smaller issues and um, as much as you want to just bundle in more to the scope, not letting it and say, okay, this can be, you know, a follow on project, a version two, uh, to what we're building here. Um, I think is one of those. Ryan, I feel like in a short amount of time, we've gotten a glimpse into some of the skills that you've kind of honed and maybe already naturally had at a young age, <clears throat> whether it's like your eye towards product and kind of the taxonomy of like what's what's needed and what's not, or whether it's this kind of quiet confidence, you know, I can take this challenge on. I don't I don't have a plane, but I'll build it on the on the way. If you could add, and you and I'd say you also talked about the value of complementary skill sets. You know, you and your father. If you could add a skill set to your repertoire, like if like Matrix style, I know kung fu. Right? Is there a thing that you wish you knew tomorrow that you think would make you, you know, even more uh, effective and kind of dangerous in your role as founder, CEO, kind of lead product person at Red Ready, or maybe just in general in starting companies? There's so many I want to say. <laughs> Picking one is tough. I mean, I think um, obviously the. The hiring managing of teams is really important um, to just continually get better. That is something that I think about a ton. Um, not necessarily that it's not there, but just that it can always be better. So I, I, that's a big focus of mine. Um, obviously, the I took, you'll probably laugh at that, given that we're, we're speaking founder to investor, but probably the fundraising side of things. I mean, I think what comes naturally to me more so is, is actually operating the business. And I mean, we obviously get the luxury of of uh, seeing that um, over the course of months, but I think in in a short period of meeting someone and saying, "Hey, in the next two meetings, three meetings, you're going to have to you're going to have to understand me as a person or this company as a whole," um, where you don't have the luxury of getting to know uh, how incredibly dedicated or how much we uh, dig into KPIs, probably well beyond on our our co uh, company's age, um, and conveying all of that in a short period of time, I think is um, something that I've continually wanted to improve. Um, I think matrix style, that'd be a nice one to, to perfect over time, but I'll, I'll take the, I'll take the incremental improvements if I have to do it that way too. Awesome. You, you know, I'm, I'm going to steal one of Will's question, but he may have springboarded off of a time in one of our meetings where I pointed out that you do bear a physical resemblance to Roger Federer. But also, you seem to have a, I'll call it a, a, a spiritual resemblance to him in that he's a guy who never gets rattled. You, you never see him sort of lunging out of control. And you're also a guy who seems always to be, you know, one step ahead of the ball. Uh, I don't think we've asked you a lot of questions you hadn't thought about before. What rattles you? What gets you going? Ah, holy crap. Um, I'm not sure that I'm not sure there's too much. I mean, there's uh, there's certainly things that I struggle with in terms of challenges that we face. Um, but I do think that I mean, we talked about it from a product perspective. Uh, I think that same type of mentality can be applied to nearly anything else, whether it's um understanding whether it's the hiring process or it's um, the marketing perspective. I mean, when we talk about how we've run ads is very, very similar to the same way that we've uh, built our product. It has been testing, iterating and measuring uh, what works and what doesn't and why. Um, so certainly there are things that we don't have enough data to understand yet, or we have to try out more things to figure out. But I, I'm not sure there's too much where I just say, you know, you can't do it. I mean, ultimately you can, someone's going to, um, so, you know, why not let it be you and then go for it? Hold on. I, I, I have to believe there's like a time or certain set of circumstances in which 
you feel like you're over your skis or rattled or anxious or nervous or like, I mean, you know, what was the last time you don't have to mention what the, you know, what happened, but like circumstances in which you're sitting there saying like, Oh, I, I can't handle this or I'm, I'm frazzled or I'm yeah so anxious and like, I can't, I can't move, you know, like wh what rattles you? Yeah. I mean, in terms of being anxious or overwhelmed, uh, I think every day, I mean, that's, I think that's the matter of being an entrepreneur. Um, but I think that's where, and not just support system friends, family wise, but company wise, co-founder wise, team wise, um, there's the ability to go back to them. I mean, in the early days, it was like just me and Ed. Um, now we have a team of you know, almost 20. If I feel at this point, hey, you know, I'm I'm overwhelmed in terms of trying to solve this uh, engineering challenge, I have the luxury now of going to other developers on my team and saying, hey, this is what we're thinking through. This is what we're trying to figure out. Do you have any ideas? Um, that happens probably on a daily basis. Uh, same thing on the marketing side of things or sales side of things, customer support side of things, or just strategically understanding, you know, who are we going to partner with or not partner with? What things are, are we going to integrate? Um, I have that that luxury of talking with the people around me that, um, you know, I think we've, we've done a great job of pulling together the, the right group of people that really do work well together, have that same and similar mindset. And ultimately, um, I, it's not so much offloading the, the, the stress of it, but um, sharing that and then reducing it together in terms of figuring it out. Uh, but I mean, that it happens probably with almost every aspect of, of a business every day of my life. I, I like that concept of sharing and then reducing. That's, uh, that's really interesting. Curious about one other thing, because you are a, a cool, calm guy, Federer-esque. What gives you that yes feeling, that, that thing that's, you know, makes you go, yeah, where you just want to jump up and punch the sky. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say, so when someone comes back and voices how much something we have done for them matters, that to me, almost more than anything really excites me. I mean, to the point that uh, like, I remember the, the day we got our very first customer for about a year and a half. I mean, we, we were in development. Uh, we didn't really have customer building a product, um, obviously company incredibly long way from that. Uh, but I remember also the day we, we hit our, our hundredth customer and Ed and I happened to be in the same place that day and we were, you know, screaming, cheering, you know, happy to have them on. But I mean, also the, the times where I get on the phone with somebody or I talk to someone that is a customer, um, that comes back and says, whether it's on the landlord side or the tenant side of things, um, how much this has changed their life in some sort of way, that to me is where it all becomes worth it. You know, the hours you pour into making a product and, and we, I even have some developers on our team that I, I share the same sentiment with that have talked about, you know, having worked on a product before where you didn't have a customer on the other side that was able to come back and say how much that mattered to you, how much that the, it pains you to say, I'm pouring all of this work into this and, and I'm not getting to see, you know, all of these users using it and coming back and saying how great it is to have them come back and validate all that you pour, you know, your heart into, uh, it, it's, it's what you do it for. It's what makes it all worth it. And, and what about the flip side of that? Like, oh, I get hurts. the sense you're not somebody who's intimidated by, you know, taking on work, but w what are like the most frustrating parts of this journey or the job or, you know, what are the things that you dread? I mean, it, it's probably the exact flip side of that scenario. If someone's unhappy, that's that's what I dread. I mean, because the, again, you, you've you still poured all of that time and effort into trying to make this near as close to perfect as you possibly can, you know, experience and product uh, for this person. And ultimately they're unhappy. You didn't, you didn't live up to what they wanted. Um, and so that's where, uh, yeah, it's, it's the total, total polar opposite of that, where Someone's incredibly happy makes me incredibly happy. <laughs> if they're if they're unhappy with it, that hurts me. But I mean, it ultimately makes me go, okay, well, specifically, why weren't they? 
and if we could replay this scenario, because I won't necessarily replay it with this particular person, but there will be another landlord or another tenant using the platform in the future that will likely take these similar sets of actions. How do I make it seamless for that person? And so the next person that comes in says, hey, this was a great experience. I can't believe you thought of all of these things. But in reality, it was unfortunately probably, you know, some experience I had with someone before that, you know, it didn't li live up to their expectations. So it's just a matter of, you know, learning from that poor experience and making it happen less, if not at all. Most of us in life have times where we'd like to rewind the tape. As you think about this journey, six years, what's the time that you sit and you go, wow, I wish I could have a replay here? I don't know. I think rewinding is, it's dangerous. I mean, it, the, the ripple effect of what you would have change after that, I don't think it would be worth. I don't know that I necessarily say, could I rewind to this point? But I definitely think there are situations where I say, okay, I didn't make the right call there, or I didn't spend the, the amount of time on, say, this instead of that. Um, like in the early days, I think we probably spent, um, when it goes actually back to your scope question, in the very, very early days, I spent a ton of time trying to add a lot of features before we really let anybody use it. Um, and it was great because once they used it, they liked it a lot. That also tells me that there were probably months and months ahead of that, that we could have had earlier adopters on the platform giving feedback that we could have learned faster if we had just started to let people in. Um, and I think the the lesson I learned from that is kind of going back to our earlier conversation about, you know, don't let that scope creep happen. Release smaller pieces ahead of time. Be transparent with people of, hey, I would like these other 19 things as well. But, you know, there's only so many hours in a day I can give you this piece today and it will help in this way. And in the meantime, I'm also going to work on these other things and I'll release them to you as soon as they're ready. Um, and it, it's kind of nice from that perspective, I came to find that the person feels like they are a part of building this with you, even though they're a customer because ultimately their um, feedback is driving what you're building rather than you building everything up front and then them giving you feedback. And the flip side of that is what's the best decision you think you've made so far on this journey, aside from deciding to take the journey? Probably my co-founder. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I would say co-founder, investors, and team. Can I droop those all into us, the people? Um, I think ultimately, like, we would not have been able to do anything close to what we do today if it weren't for... Um, obviously the, the groups of investors and that was the, in terms of TIA ventures and, and Tribeca and River Park and, um, all of the people that have invested in us so far, we looked at it from a perspective like beyond capital. Like how can we see this as a partnership that goes beyond this, that we look to you for advice. I mean, as you know, we definitely come to, to you for questions and issues we have, but the same thing goes to the, the team as well. I mean, in terms of back to Will's question about, you know, wh when you start to struggle, what can you do? Going back to that co-founder, going back to that team. Um, I think it's not just being satisfied with saying, okay, I have a support system of friends and family when I'm starting this thing, but also building out that system of support, um, not just from the encouragement perspective, but also from the advice perspective and skill set perspective of how can I make this system stronger as we continue to grow? Co-founders, investors, team, even partners, honestly, that we've we've started to work with over time. Ryan, if we could shift just a bit to the business, um, you know, and, and what's going on there, you know, you've built this really great product. You guys have accomplished a tremendous amount in six years, a lot of happy customers, happy investors, and yet like we're just scratching the surface, right? I think you've talked about 15 plus million of these landlords across the country and clearly you're serving some of them very well. They love this. The tenants love it. And yet, I, you know, I don't think anybody has significant share of this market. What are the challenges to trying to make sure that everybody who has a property, you know, can benefit from a product like Rent Ready? What, what's difficult about scaling up in, in this industry when the opportunity seems so tremendous? Yeah, I mean, certainly part of it is the 
the product decision side of things where we talked about making sure they have everything they need, nothing they don't, and how that translates across geographic regions, portfolio sizes, uh, perspectives of I'm a, I'm a single person that runs this, or I'm spouses that run this, or a family, or just partners running this. But I think one of the, the maybe the hardest challenge in terms of it is, is identifying that long tail market. Um, and it's something that we've seen um, others struggle with. We, it, I mean, in the early days, very much struggle with. Over time, we've gotten much better at, but can continue to get much better at. Um, you know, a landlord doesn't put on their LinkedIn, I'm a landlord. Um, they, they don't even possibly have a company set up online that you could search. So you do have to be creative in terms of how you get to them um, and how you build up rapport with them and then ultimately uh, grow that base because it's it's not just, um, you know, call people up in a phone book and, and say, hey, I know you're a landlord. Uh, here's this software that we made for you. And um, the flip side of that is, it's it, for for many of them they, they don't know that there's much out there. for for our particular market they're they're using pen and paper and spreadsheets they're not necessarily looking for something um and uh at least for now we're working on changing that but at least for now for for a good portion of that 15 million they just know pen and paper and spreadsheets exist and and they don't know much beyond that in terms of that there's these other softwares out there that are trying to help specifically them i mean that segment of the market too not just enterprise. A lot of them may know the enterprises out there, but not as much their segment. Have you seen, I mean, you've been around for a number of years now in, in that period of time, have you seen structural shifts in the industry or in the customers maybe tied to that as, as COVID, you know, impacted that in a positive or negative way? And now those are two Separate, but probably somewhat related questions. Yeah, there have definitely been shifts. Um, COVID definitely caused shifts. Um, some, interestingly, for features we already have on the platform today, and some for uh, things we didn't have at all. So, for example, we had video maintenance requests, which were a feature that were added because a landlord had shared their personal stories of um there's a big difference between a leaking sink that I can uh, throw a bowl under and I can fix it tomorrow as a landlord or one that's destroying my kitchen floor. And at 3 a.m. I need to get out of bed and go over and fix this, this tenant's leaking sink. So if you can give me a video of what's going wrong, I can understand how urgent is this issue. And so that's what it was initially designed for. With COVID, it was really interesting to see that feature was repurposed to say, I'm not even coming to the apartment at all. So for a tenant that has say a leaking sink and oh it, it turns out that it's some part missing from the faucet above the landlord can say okay i can see what's wrong with this i will send you the part you can fix it yourself no one needs to come into your apartment and so it was really interesting to see a feature that already existed there uh be completely reused without us suggesting it just them being creative with what they had in front of them and solving their own problem and then on the flip side of that we had uh a lot of landlords say hey i have been doing uh, my lease signing with pen and paper, and I had no problem with that. And now I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want tenants coming into my office and grabbing my pen and writing on this piece of paper. I want them to do it electronically. Can you give me a way to do that? So we actually did build uh, during that first summer of COVID um, electronic lease signing to solve the problem we were hearing from landlords and tenants. You know, you just made me think about an experience I had two days ago where the heat in our home wasn't working quite as well as we wanted. It took a while to heat up. And, you know, I called up the service provider and I got on a FaceTime with the, with the person. He was sitting on his couch. And it wound up taking us kind of an hour and a half to basically troubleshoot the problem and figure it out. But along the way, he kind of taught me to fish, right? Like in another world, he might have come parked his car, walked in, and I probably wouldn't have interacted with him. And yet yesterday he kind of walked me through this issue and it got resolved and he didn't have to leave his house, but it did consume an hour plus, hour and a half of my time, which got me thinking about like, how do I value my time? And I'm just curious, like your, your analogy or your real world example of leaking sink, I'm not even showing up to the house. I'm going to send you the part, you fix it. Are we in a better spot because of that or not? And I, there's probably no right answer to this, but 
I just went through this. And as I look back on it, I don't know, I feel like I have a bit more mastery over my home, but I also pay a service provider who basically said, I'm not getting off my couch. You figure it out. I'll kind of walk you through it. What, what's better? What do you think that, you know, like, I think it depends on the situation. And I think the, the approach that at least I've seen people taking is in my opinion, at least probably the best one. And that's been that when they want to do it themselves, they voice that and they do that. And so, um, it's almost an individual choice that if you feel comfortable fixing it and you don't want someone in your home and you're okay doing that, then great. Give me the part. I'll do it. Um, if you don't want to spend the time doing that or, Hey, I just want to let someone in and I'm going to keep doing work while they go fix the sink. Um, then great. You can do that too. And, um, I think it's, I don't think there's necessarily a right or wrong. It's just more so what you, you prefer. So right now, there are a lot of well-funded competitors out there, but nobody's gotten from the data we see more than maybe half of 1% market share. So, so this is a two-part, 20-point question. Why haven't they? And is it possible you guys are just way too early. The world's not ready yet for this kind of software. Um, so in terms of why haven't they, I think a big part of it goes back to uh, that these are individuals often that have full-time jobs that uh, are doing this in their free time. So if they are going to spend their time using your product, uh, it needs to be really good. And they talk to each other. So if one of them has a bad experience, the others are definitely going to know that they had a bad experience. And so I think from that perspective, um, it is not only just a hard segment to identify, but it's also a, a hard segment to, to honestly please. You have to be willing to try to continually take in this feedback and take action on that feedback and do it very, very quickly um, in order to make them happy. And making them happy ultimately then allows them to serve as a gateway to others. And uh, certainly there's a huge amount of uh, market share still open in front of us. Um, but at least from even others in our space that we've, we've talked to, um, we've been able to grow at a faster rate than even, even others in the prop tech space as much as that has gained traction. And I think a big part of that does go back to the fact that uh, other landlords on the platform are talking to each other. So it's not just us Although part of it is definitely us being creative in how to find them, it's also that when we do find them and they talk to their friends who are also landlords, that they get that same uh, affirmation that, hey, you shouldn't be doing this with spreadsheets anymore, um, that you should be trying this other way. It, it is going to save you time. It's going to save you money. Same thing for your tenants. Um, and then in terms of being the right time, I think uh, maybe for some of them that some of the competitors that have been in the space for 10 or 15 years, I think that probably was a bit early. Um, and I, I do think that that was probably harder even for them. And in, 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 at that time, they didn't have communities um, that were looking out for each other and trying to help each other improve as landlords, not just with property management specifically, but just everything that goes into being a landlord. And so that is an advantage that we have today. Um, but a lot of it is also, and, and COVID has certainly helped with um, a lot of people saying, I know that there's probably a better way, but is it is now the time to do it? And I think for a lot of people that have been considering over time, should I make that payment switch? A lot have. And we've, we've seen it not just in property management, but, but just in uh, digital payments in general. Digital payments, our, our own payment processor shared with us that uh, they estimated that it helped accelerate the, the digital payment space by five years at least in terms of the adoption in that way. And so rent payments digitally is certainly one very large portion of our business, um, but there's a lot that goes into that and that draws a lot of parallels to other pieces as well, like the maintenance and lease signing and applications where you say, okay, it is time. Um, I've, I've done it this way for a long time, but it's taking more time throughout my day. Um, it's taking more effort on both people's parts. And, and ultimately there is a solution that, you know, my neighbor down the street that also owns some properties is saying, that he likes so or she likes, why am I not doing it that way too? What One of the quick ones, because I know Wills has three or four excellent closing ones. <clears throat> we sometimes hear 
people say, you know, don't you don't need to talk to customers. If you had asked customers back in the old days, if Henry Ford had asked them what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. So customers don't know what they need. However, we look at you and Ed, and you guys are relentlessly customer centric, asking questions, surveying, going back. Where's that come from? And why aren't you just saying, you know what? We know what they need. We'll give it to them. Well, I, I think the rebuttal to the the Henry Ford scenario would be that if he had just asked them, what would you like? And they said a faster horse and he didn't question that at all and went and built it, that would have been bad. But if he said, wait, well, what if you had something that was faster than a horse, more durable than a horse? You don't have to feed it. It's not going to run away when you park it. Would you like that more than a faster horse? They would probably say yes, and he still asked his customers. So I think there is, it's it's not just one-sided where you're collecting feedback and then immediately doing from customers. It's collecting that feedback and trying to understand, okay, all of these different people's approaches, is this the best way? And should we suggest something as well? And there's nothing wrong with you su suggesting something as a founder, and certainly we do it all the time. And sometimes they tell us, absolutely not, <laughs> don't go with this new idea you you suggested. And other times they say, can't believe I didn't think of that. Absolutely go with this instead of the faster horse. And I think that's where um, uh, I give him a lot of credit. He has comes up with some crazy great ideas. Um, but I think that's where you get to, you get to play a little bit of baseball as well as, as the, the co-founder or anybody on the team that's interacting with the customer that's giving you feedback. You can talk and actually have a dialogue with them. Interesting. It sounds like there's like a, a mix of kind of competitiveness, but also like that can quickly shift to collaboration. It almost, you know, I, I come away with this idea of like, we just have to do what works, but we have to rigorously test to figure out what does work. And I, I, I have this I, vision of you because I know you and your father play pretty intense pick up basketball, <laughs> like how do you, how do you move from competitiveness to collaboration to competitiveness to collaboration, like over and over again? Like what, what allows you, how do you know when, when, when it should be combative and, you know, combative and trying to like wrestle versus when we can, two, you know, one plus one is greater than three. Yeah. I mean, we only play on the same basketball team together these days so that helps but <laughs> so no i mean i think i think it is you're totally right it is a give and take and i don't know that there's necessarily a, a science to it and, and it probably is different for people other than us too i mean we have found uh kind of our proper ebb and flow of it i would say probably more often than not we go into the situation uh from the opposite perspective or not necessarily opposite, but we, we come with different ideas. Um, and I think that's good. The goal is by the end of the conversation, we get to the same idea. So I think, uh, I think it's good to start out in terms of, you say competitive or collaborative, um, you come with your ideas and you share all of those. Um, it's a, it's, I don't know if much equating to like a court case is right or not, but it's, I mean, if you, you have two lawyers come in and they present all of these facts and all of these ideas, ideally at the end of it, everybody agrees. I mean, maybe if you the lawyers aren't going to agree to the jury, you know, we're serving as also our own jury in, in these conversations. Um, we present all of these ideas, all of why we think the benefits in terms of pros and cons of what we're proposing is the right way. And then we start to try to poke holes in them and even poke holes in your own idea or share those up front of where it falls short. Um, and I, honestly, we say it a lot where we'll come in and say something along the lines of, I'm not saying this is perfect. It's just the best one I could think of. Uh, what do we think of this? You know, help me figure out how to take away the worst part of this and keep the best part of it. And ultimately we'll get to a better solution. I think that's, that's just, um, in, in my opinion, a good way of problem solving, but it's how we approach most of those situations. Is there any big, big thing right now that you guys are on opposite sides or that you can share, or maybe it's too, too much part of the secret sauce of what's coming or anything as you look back where you're like, you know, what, we still haven't come to this. We both came at this from different angles and we still haven't come to the same kind of answer. That's a good question. I'm not sure there is. 
then I can share anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, um, and in the we, interest we have, of, we always have some side bet that we have some fun with and say, okay, I think this is the right way. This is the wrong way. So we definitely have some, so ones I can't share exactly what it is, but whether I lose or not, I owe him dinner. So that'll be, it'll be fun to find out. <laughs> <Awesome. laughs> Well, and you've been super gracious with your time here. And in the interest of kind of sharing what's to come, um, you know, maybe, maybe a good time to wrap up. If you get this whole thing right, rent ready, right? Like, and I know it's never going to be perfect. You'll always be making it better. You'll always be talking to your customers, figuring out what other things they need. But if you get it right, and we're looking at this years down the road, um, <clears throat> Beyond just kind of software that sits in between tenants and landlords, any ideas about what you will have created if you've created something bigger than, you know, what it is at kind of obvious face value? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, ultimately, we will have created an experience that makes it almost hard for people at that point to remember how bad it was now, which I think for most people that currently uh, live anywhere renting. Um, a lot of them have a, some bad experience that they remember. And for me to tell them they're not going to remember that, they're going to say you're crazy for. Uh, but ultimately, fast forwarding, uh, I think that will become the reality. It will become something so simple and so easy that people will almost laugh that it was something that we had to solve at one point or not believe that it was actually an issue. Um, that to me is the holy grail of it. But the, the really interesting thing is that we, and we, it's something we've been able to show already, is that we expand a lot beyond just traditional property management. And we haven't stopped there. I mean, we talk about the renting experience, and I don't think that has to be as clear cut as simply processing rent payments and collecting an application, but going beyond that and serving as this beachhead into so many other services or so many other things that ultimately tenants and landlords both want not necessarily even in landlord or tenant capacity, but um, that they do desire. And the nice thing is we serve as that platform for them. Um, we've been able to partner with other companies that have said it's way too expensive for us to get this customer that you service if we do it on our own, or it's we never present it at the right time because we're just not there when it's happening. One of the beauties of where we sit between tenants and landlords in this relationship that they're having is that we are able to um, share with them something that's genuinely helpful to them, something they've asked for at a time that matters to them, um, like credit reporting in terms of boosting their credit. It doesn't directly relate to rent at all. But the tenants came to us and said, hey, I'm paying my rent. It's going off into the ether. Let me actually do something with that to build my own credit, to get a car loan or eventually a home loan or something I want to do. And it's a way that we've been able to build on that core service of paying rent into something completely separate from paying rent or renting any apartment and just help this person build credit as a human for the rest of their life. That concept of we'll look back on it and almost not believe that it was done the way it was and that it could be this easy and simple. Is there a space or an industry or a product that has done that for another industry that you look at and you're like, I want it to look and feel like what this did for that industry or that customer? that type of customer? Yeah, I, I think um, one that I, I really enjoyed, and, and honestly, I can't say I've seen it in the US very much, but um, I, I had the chance to travel to China at one point and, and use WeChat. And one of the interesting things is that company started very much as a chat service, um, just people talking to each other. Um, you can use that to uh, order your food. You can use it to um, uh, have someone come clean your dog uh, or give them a bath or something. Um, you can do almost anything through that. And it's it's interesting to me how well they've done at um, at their core, connect people and solve an experience issue. Um, but from that, then uh, branch off into addressing additional pain points and presenting those at times that matter to people. Um, and although we're doing a completely different thing in terms of uh, property management software versus a uh, chat software, um, in a lot of ways, the way that we've been able to branch into services up to this point that ultimately solve some pain point that often is a landlord or a tenant coming to us and explaining what the problem is, and then us trying to figure out how we give them a solution to that. Um, it, we share a lot of commonalities in that respect. Awesome. 
What, what haven't we asked you that you think we should have? I don't know. I always say you guys got them all. <laughs> <laughs> That's, well, but let, let, let me ask you differently. Is there one thing about Ryan Barone that very few people know that you actually think is important about you? Question. I think, I, I don't know that everyone necessarily knows it, but I think one of them that, that came back to on this call is certainly the, um, we talked about the caring piece of it, but I think beyond that goes like helping people. Um, that is a very important piece uh, to me in terms of what I like to do. Uh, my friends joke that I will often not say no to them. Um, that's come back to bite me a few times where they said, hey, want to go run a half marathon with me? And I'm not a runner. And I'll say yes, because I don't want them to go run that alone. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think a lot of it comes down to um, being willing to help people. If you have questions about something, obviously I've, I've leaned on a lot of other people to get to uh, where I am today and ask them for help along the way or advice along the way. I like to keep that same open, transparent door with other people. So um, you need something, ask. <laughs> and I'll most of the time be pretty happy to help if I can. So well, um, I think that'd be one thing I would add. But Well, I, I will tell you that it's a good note to close on because at the start, actually before the start of our Rent Ready relationship, you know that we talked to customers and uh, we talked to one customer that we still remember the conversation with. I think she was a New Zealander living uh, in Washington or Oregon. And I'm going to quote her, and it's a slightly off-color quote. But at the end of our interview, we do something called the deprivation exercise, where we say, you may have, and it's just an exercise, you may have heard that Rent Ready will be, uh, they'll be taking Rent Ready down for six months, but they'll be back with plenty of new features. And we sit back to wait to hear how the customer responds. And in about half a second, she said, oh, I can't do her accent, but she said, oh, no, without Rent Ready, I'll be in the shit. <laughs> so this was a customer that clearly was benefiting and somebody, to your point, that you helped. Yeah. Ryan, really appreciate, appreciate your time. I appreciate it, Andy. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you, Wills, for having me on. Awesome. Thank you, Ryan. Take care. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview. Hopefully it encouraged you to improve some aspect of your game as an entrepreneur or an investor. Stay tuned for future interviews. Please visit our website where you'll find a bunch more content, pieces that we've written, and interviews with other founders and investors. TIA Ventures is a seed stage fund focusing primarily on early stage B2B technology companies with an obsessive focus on end customers and early teams.